And, uh, those uh, live and good afternoon to those uh, joining us virtually, um, whether it's your morning, afternoon or evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Ashford. I'm a partner and co-head of international arbitration at Fox Williams. And this is our debate, or perhaps more strictly a panel discussion, uh, on the procedural issues raised in this year's uh, vis moot problem. Uh, certainly those on the physical panel before you will only be attempting to answer it from an English law perspective. Uh, but we are joined uh, for, I think, the third year running by Professor Denis Morales uh, virtually, who will give us a civil law, French law perspective. Uh, the good thing about uh, webinars in lockdown is that you didn't have to give warnings about fire escapes, putting your phones onto silent and those sorts of things. That was the one positive that we learned from that. Uh, we're not expecting a fire uh, alarm practice this afternoon, so if it does go off, uh, head for the doors, marked fire doors and exit and things like that. Um, without further ado, though, I will introduce you to our panel. On my far left is Lord Nicholas Wilson. Uh, Nicholas was a Supreme Court judge from 2011 to 2020 and now is a sought after arbitrator at Fountain Court. Uh, to my immediate left is Annalise Day QC. Uh, on her own words on her website, a leading lawyer of her generation, a standout genius, an, an absolute rock star at the top of her game, and previous international arbitration silk of the year. So uh, we are in hallowed company. And joining us virtually, uh, Denis Morales, Professor Denis Morales, who is a professor of law and attorney at the Paris Bar, and a professor of law at Aix-Marseille University. Uh, he specializes in commercial arbitration law, both as arbitrator and counsel. Uh, you may submit questions if you're virtual through the Q&A function. Uh, if you're um, live, you may do so by raising your hand at an appropriate moment. I'll indicate when that is. Uh, as a, the, the, this year's problem in the VIS moot concerns a, a putative contract with a putative law. So was the contract formed at all? If so, what are its terms? Specifically, whether some standard terms were incorporated or not. Those standard terms have an agreement to arbitrate. And as we'll all know, uh, agreements to arbitrate can have their own proper law, distinct or the same as uh, their sort of host contract or matrix contract. And if so, if that was incorporated, what was its proper law? So those are, the, <clears throat> those are the questions. I will start, however, by a very brief introduction on how contracts are formed or not under English law, because it's not that interesting. We don't want to spend too long on it. But I will simply uh, give you the highlight. Uh, and the highlight can be taken from um, uh, the speech of Lord Clark in the Supreme Court in a case called RTS Flexible Systems, Molokrai Alor Muller. And he said, in beguilingly simple terms, well, <clears throat> whether there is a binding contract between the parties. And if so, upon what terms? Depends on what they have agreed. So far, so good, you may think. It depends not upon their subjective state of mind, but upon a consideration of what was communicated between them by words or conduct, and whether that leads objectively to a conclusion that they intended to create legal relations, and had agreed upon all the terms which they regarded or the law requires as essential for the formation of legally binding relations. Even if certain terms of economic or other significance to the parties have not been finalized, an objective appraisal of their words and conduct may lead to the conclusion that they did not intend agreement of such terms to be a precondition to a concluded and legally binding agreement. Where there is a disputed incorporation of standard terms, the test is whether or not one party's standard terms are incorporated depends on whether that which each party says and does is such as to lead a reasonable person in their position to believe that those terms were to govern their legal relations. The court has to determine what each party was reasonably entitled to conclude from the acts and words of the other. The question is one of fact to which prior authority, authority may form an uncertain guide. And the easy thing to remember here is it's a, the other Clark, Sir Christopher Clark, in this instance, 
So one was Lord Clark in the Supreme Court and Christopher Clark in this instance. It's not necessary that the conditions contained in the standard form document should have been read by the person receiving it or that he should have been made subjectively aware of their import or effect. The rules are, firstly, if a person receiving the document did not know that there was writing or printing upon it, he is not bound. If he knew there was writing or printing contained or referred to conditions, he is bound. And thirdly, if the party tendering the document did what was reasonably sufficient to give the other party notice of the conditions, and if the other party knew there was writing or printing, but did not know it contained conditions, then the conditions will form the terms of the contract between them. Special rules, however, apply to the incorporation of an arbitration agreement. Um, Section 6.2 of the Arbitration Act says, the reference in an agreement to a written form of arbitration clause or to a document containing an arbitration clause constitutes an agreement, sorry, constitutes an arbitration agreement if the reference is such as to make that clause part of the agreement. So that was very deliberate wording by the Departmental Advisory Committee. Uh, there had been a prior case uh, called Alton and Kent Services where the two judges in the Court of Appeal had disagreed on the law but agreed on the result, so it didn't particularly matter. Uh, <clears throat> so that was in issue and uh, the DAC decided to leave it to be developed in the courts rather than provide a solution. Um, so different rules apply, as I say, for um, uh, arbitration uh, provisions. But if a contract between A and B incorporates That's all the terms of a previous now. contract between them, other than the terms newly agreed in later contract, there should be no lack of clarity in respect of what was incorporated. So typically, if A and B contract, and then later on contract again, say the same terms, except we're now buying widgets rather than squidgets, and the price is different, uh, then they will contract on the same terms previously. It gets complicated in multi-contract cases, and particularly things like construction, where you get an arbitration clause that says the contractor and the subcontractor, which is then incorporated into the sub-subcontract, where there is no contractor, there's only the subcontractor and the sub-subcontractor, uh, and you have to do some linguistic magic to see whether the arbitration clause is incorporated or not. And that's also, Sir Christopher Clarke, all of that latter bit, in a different case, I won't tell you the name, but uh, anyone who's desperately interested, do shout. So that's the um, a very whistle-stop tour of um, where we are in terms of formation of a contract and incorporation of terms under English law. Um, Denis, would you like to tell us whether it's the same or different under uh, French law or civil law? Sure. And good um, afternoon to you. To you. Sorry? <laughs> good afternoon to you. Yes, good afternoon to, to everybody, and thank you for your, uh, your invitation. Uh, it is always a pleasure to, to take part uh, in your panels. Um, to answer your question well, and I think it will not be uh, surprising to anybody, but uh, under the CISG or the UNIDWAR principles, uh, the way a contract is formed and the way uh, terms can be incorporated into it are not so different from what you just described about uh, English law, because on this point, I think uh, most legal systems tend done? to converge. I've probably done something. Uh, do you hear me? Denis, just wait. We're um, having a, a minor technical problem. Yeah. Okay. Have I muted you or done something? Uh, where might that be? Christina, do you know what I've done? Hang on. No? Hmm? Ooh, ooh. No, try, try again, Denis. Uh, do you hear me? No. We can't hear you. No, no. we've lost you. I'm, I'm speaking. Lost audio, we've got visual. All right.
No? I'm not on mute, so the problem is probably at your end. Yeah. Um, what we'll do, if that's all right with everybody, uh, Denis, do you want to uh, log off and log on again? Oh, Great sure. Answer to sure. many problems. Okay. Um, and we'll move on to the next question and come to Annelies on an anchor recap. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, he's, let's just see. Oh, we can hear online. That's, okay. that's, yeah. Yeah. That was just the speaker. Yeah. So I'm back. Do, do you hear me? No. We're not getting, we're not hearing you, but I understand people online can hear you, but then we're getting an awful echo here. Oh, yeah. You coming to help? Marvellous. Apologies, whilst we sort that out, people here obviously can hear that, people online I think can hear us. So I was going to move to the next topic and then we'll come back to Denis, if that's all right. Sure, sure. Um, whilst we, the technicians play with things. Okay. Yep, is that good? Yeah. We'll, we'll do that. So we'll move on to, we were going to have a recap. Um, uh, the proper law, uh, is, is really important in these instances because that's the first step of the inquiry, usually. And uh, Annelise is going to tell us something about Enka and Chubb and Kabab Jai and Kalt Foods, which are the two Supreme Court cases. Away we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to do, uh, go through all the judgments you'll be pleased to hear because Enka was three to two. If you don't read anything else, it is definitely worth reading. Um, even if just to see the quality of the reasoning. Um, it's, it's a fascinating case. Um, just to remind those who might not know about the facts of Enka, it all arose from a fire in a power plant in Russia. And Chubb, who were the insurers of the plant's owners, brought proceedings in Russia against Enka, who were the subcontractor, alleging that they were liable for the fire. Enka then began proceedings in England, and they argued that the dispute was subject to an arbitration agreement, and they sought an anti-suit injunction. So the key issue was how the governing law of an arbitration agreement was to be determined when the law applicable to the contract contained a, a differing, um, that differed from the law of the seat of the arbitration. And the majority, and it was a three to two decision, held that the, because the contract contained no choice of law that was intended to govern the contract or the arbitration agreement within it, that therefore the validity and scope of the arbitration agreement was governed by the law of the chosen seat of the arbitration. And that was because it was said to be the law uh, with which the agreement to arbitrate was mo most closely connected. It's important to remember that Enker is a, a case where there was no express and no implied choice of law. And particularly the implied test also has to be satisfied before you move on to the Enker test. And I think sometimes that's slightly uh, overlooked. Second case, just to remind everybody about, is Kebab G. I think is how it's pronounced. Uh, and that was all about a franchise agreement which contained uh, arbitration in Paris. It was originally a franchise agreement between Kebab G and a company who I'll call X. And it granted a license to operate a franchise. Now, what happened was that X subsequently became a subsidiary 
of um, a company called Cout Food Group. And that led to a dispute uh, arising. There was a dispute under the franchise agreement uh, and then Kebabji referred that to arbitration against KFG only, so not X. KFG said, well, we're not a party to this franchise agreement, and they took part in the arbitration under protest. Now, the arbitrators, and again, this was a majority decision, found that KFG was a party to the arbitration agreement. But the Supreme Court held that the arbitration agreement following ENCA was governed by English law and that in English law, there was no real prospect of a court finding that KFG became a party to the arbitration agreement. Um, conversely, the Paris Court of Appeal up, up found something different. I don't know if Denis wants to talk about that, if he can talk now. He'd love to, yeah. he can talk. Whether we can hear it. Yeah. Uh, do, do you hear me? Yes, do you hear me? No, uh, we still can't no. hear you. Um, People online can. This is this is the problem here. It's something to do with the sound coming into here. No one's offering me a solution to that. Hello, do you hear me? Hello? Well, we can't. Do something else? Okay. It doesn't, doesn't flow in quite the way it was intended. Yeah, well, let me, I'll, I'll inadequately summarise what the Paris Court of Appeal Do. said, and then Denis can come back and tell me what I've got wrong. <laughs> the, the Paris Court of Appeal upheld the majority decision of the tribunal. So complete uh, opposite result to what the English court decided. And the reason for that was that they concluded that the choice of English law as the governing law of the franchise agreement was, quotes, not sufficient to establish the common will of the parties to submit the arbitration clauses to English law and thus to derogate from the substantive rules of international arbitration applicable at the seat of arbitration expressly designated by the parties. So the Paris Court of Appeal said no, French law was the governing law of the arbitration agreement and KFG could be considered a party. And I understand that KFG has appealed that to the Cour de Cassation uh, and that decision is still pending. But if we can ever hear Denis, he can probably give us some more uh, insight on that. Can yeah, I, I Nicholas, do. Yeah. An unattractive uh, aspect of human nature, or certainly an unattractive aspect of my human nature, is to think that when one leaves an institution, it's going to go downhill. <laughs> and so I looked at these two decisions, very recent decisions of the Supreme Court, with a very critical eye. But I have to say, through gritted teeth, that I thought that the quality, as Annalise has just the quality of argument uh, on both sides was exceptional. And when I read uh, Hamblin and Leggett, I was absolutely in Inca. I was uh, absolutely convinced that it was the law of the seat of uh, arbitration, namely English law, that should prevail. And then when I read um, uh, um, Burroughs and Sales, I was absolutely convinced uh, that uh, it was the law of con the contract that, as it were, pulled the arbitration agreement into it and it was that law that applied um, and so it was going to be a uh, uh, russian russian law um i suppose that if one was to try to choose between these two uh, very convincing presentations um it might be that the court of uh, the uh, the majority said no express clause here governing the governing the arbitration clause, no uh, implied choice of law governing the arbitration clause. And so we are going to go to the closest connection. The difficulty perhaps is that the material that one can collect from the case in favor of a conclusion that there's no implied choice of law for the arbitration clause is really almost just the same as the material that one would collect 
in order to conclude that the closest connection is with uh, a particular law. And so it may be that on that very narrow basis, um, the, the, the minority had uh, the better of the argument, but there it is. And then really the kebab case surely is a, a pretty obvious um, uh, application of uh, Enka, uh, because the, um, the, the relevant um, uh, contract was governed by uh, English, English law. Um, and so uh, um, there was an implied choice of English law there. And so in the light of what they had said at Enka, you then come on to closest connection. There was an implied choice, um, uh, and that, gov that takes the uh, arbitration clause um, uh, subject to the proper law of the, uh, the contract, which was, again, English law. And the difficulty, which ho hopefully we'll get Denis coming in soon, the difficulty, as Annalisa said, is that the French courts um, ha have taken a different view. Um, where, you've, where you've got two, we might come on to this with a case called uh, um, lifestyle later, where you've got two perfectly reasonable conclusions of, uh, in relation to a point, don't you really want to choose the more sensible one, the one that works in practice? And that's where I fall down because my background is not in uh, commercial law at all. I was a family lawyer. Of course, one did a few commercial cases in the Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, but really not all that many. And so I'm new to this area. And so I have no feel for what, which is the most sensible result in terms of commercial practice. And I hope that that's something that I'm going to be able to remedy as uh, I do a few more of these uh, uh, arbitrations. Um, but I just wonder whether, if, if and insofar as the French courts were saying in, uh, in um, the, the, the second case, um, if they were saying really it is convenient to have the law of the seat of arbitration applying to an arbitration clause, I wonder whether that might be regarded as more satisfactory from a practical point of view. Annalise? Um, well, I'm going to speak up for, for Leggett and Hamlin, who I think are both brilliant jurists. I think the advantage of their approach is it's very certain as to what the outcome will be, whereas it could be said to be less certain on the minority. But I think if you want real certainty, then you specify it. But I think it is easier then to work out what the law is rather than having to apply the test closely connected, etc. cetera. Um, so I think, I think there is a practical aspect the majority to see me, perhaps. Yeah, well, I, I, I think, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, you start from a different place in France, um, mm. uh, and you start, uh, I, Denis will put a thumbs up <laughs> if I'm right, um, uh, Article 1447 of the French Civil mm. Code, which, which has a, their definition of separability, which is much stronger than separability as found in uh, Enker and Chuck. Mm. So they, they see the arbitration clause as a completely separate contract, is my understanding. Uh, and um, if you start from that point, and it's completely, if you like, insulated, and I would even suggest that that might have been English law before Enker and Chubb, and Enker and Chubb was a slight aberration. If you look at Lord Diplock in a case called Gremma Vulcan and other people, they, they talk in a much stronger terms uh, than do Leggett and Hamblin in, in Enker and Chubb about how distinct the, that, that is. So if, if I'm right on French civil code, that it is much more separate, then you, you can't import the choice from the host contract. Uh, and therefore, the French law says the mm. law of the seat governs the law of the, um, the agreement to arbitrate. So that's where they start from a different starting point, effectively, to, to an English starting point. But, but the interesting point to me is that where does that leave us? If you've got a, as in uh, Cavalry, uh, a an English law but French seat, do you start from the premise of the French seat or do you start from the premise of the English governing law? We, we know that the starting point has got to be what is the law of the putative contract. We, we need to start at finding out what that law is. That's, that's quite clear as a matter of English law. But... Um, the law of what, 
that you're talking about. So if you're saying the law of the arbitration agreement, and you're looking then at French law, uh, you say, well, no, no, it's French law is quite clear on this. It's the law of the seat, and hence Paris, and hence French law that governs. But the English start from a different starting point. So it depends on where you start your analysis, where you'll end up. Um, and again, my understanding is the, you know, the, the, the clever money is on the Cour de Cassation uh, affirming the French Cour d'Appel and saying, yeah, it is on, on that. So we've then got two very reputable jurisdictions uh, coming to a completely different answer. And how how will that be for recognition and enforcement and those sorts of things, which is what all this is about. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is that award going to be enforced? Um, and is there going to be an estoppel about whoever decides that point? Well, it is a, a profoundly unsatisfactory situation for um, international commerce. If there's an award in Paris and 22 miles away, um, it's not going to be enforced. Um, Rome one excluded arbitration agreements. And I think the UK argued that it should not be excluded. And I think if it hadn't been excluded and Rome one had dealt with this, we'd all be singing from the same hymn sheet, but it didn't deal with it. And there's a different hymn sheet in Paris from the one in London. And it's very unsatisfactory. It is, um, and I would say um, that uh, I, I think two or three countries have legislated for the proper law of the arbitration agreement. Sweden, Scotland, and I think Canada, bits of Canada at least. Um, and they've all concluded it should be the, the law of the seat rather than the governing law of the host contract. Um, and institutional rules like the LCIA also say, if you don't say, it's the law of the seat. So insofar as there is any institutional slash statutory regime around the world, uh, it is in favor of the seat, the French approach, rather than perhaps the English starting point. We haven't got you yet, Denis, have we? Can I come do, in on do you, separability? Do you hear me? Peter? Yes, you no. do, please. Isn't it section seven of the 1996 Act? Is not the, head, the heading of that uh, separability of arbitration agreements? And then it, you have the text. And the gist of it surely is that just because the substantive contract is found to be non-existent or inoperative, it doesn't, mean, doesn't follow that the arbitration clause is non-existent or inoperative. And that's extremely important. And so separability has a really crucial existential function. Uh, but I mean, does it go further? Section seven, doesn't say separability, among other things, means that. Um, it says this is what it means. And so um, I'm not sure, Peter, but your knowledge is so much greater than mine on these matters. I'm not sure that I would go along with a conclusion uh, that separability under our law goes uh, any further than this. But if it did, would it help solve the problem about the applicable law uh, of an arbitration clause? If you were to say it's separate, it doesn't mean it's opposed or in conflict in any way. Would it follow, if it was separate in, in a wider meaning of the word, would it follow that the law applicable to the arbitration clause would be less likely to be the law um, applicable to the substantive contract? I don't really see why it should be. Um, and so I don't think separability even if wider than what I understand it to be, really helps in this question of the identification of the applicable law. You're in the middle, Annelise. You have to debate, settle the debate between Nicholas and I about um, separability. It's, um, I, I've, I've written extensively on it, no doubt inaccurately. Um, but um, if, if you have something that is truly separable, then um, a lot of the decisions, starting with a uh, decision of I think Andrew Smith in a case called Arsenova, where, where he said the words, this agreement um, is governed by, et cetera, included every clause in the agreement. And uh, th th that logic effectively was taken up by uh, Hamlin and Leggett in, in Enker and Chubb to say, um, yes, when, when you say this contract, it's 
potentially an expressed choice, but certainly an implied choice, depending on the precise wording of whether it's... Um, and uh, I, I would argue that that was the sort of fussy distinction that, that was deprecated in Fiona Trust and cases like that, um, uh, that, you know, whether it says this or that contract or exactly the wording shouldn't be determinative. Uh, and there's far greater logic if, if, if you've got a wider concept of separability to say uh, it, it goes by the seat. Um, and then I think internationally we would fall into line with those nations that have made that choice, the institutions who've, who've applied their mind to it, uh, and it would give much greater certainty to business. They would know that because historically the seat has always been state, well not always, but far more often than, than a governing law has been stated in an arbitration clause. You know, arbitration, London, we all know what that means. It means that London is the seat. Uh, you pick up the Arbitration Act and all those sorts of things. Uh, we would love it if um, uh, our, our contract drafting colleagues would make an express choice of law. And I, I urge them every time I go back to the office, I say, you really must do this. And they say, yes, yes, yes. And then they forget immediately, because having very little idea of separability, it, the thought sort of escapes them. Um, but uh, an express choice would be lovely. But it hasn't been done for generations and probably will be done occasionally going forward, but only occasionally. Yeah, Casting I mean, vote is yours, Annelies. We ought to move on to something. No, I mean, I, th I think what underlying this is a more general issue that English courts tend to look at it from an English point of view, whereas perhaps French and other courts are a bit more aware of the international context. I mean, certainly in, the, in, an, in a completely different context, but um, disclosure of conflicts on arbitrators, you'll be aware of those decisions and... There's been some controversy that the English courts are out of step with the international view in terms of what should be disclosed as a conflict. And I think, again, we see that we are quite focused on our own uh, Brexit ideas yep. of what the law should be like, perhaps. Yeah, we're, we're a bit... Pr let's not get started on Halliburton. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here all night. Yeah. But I think we'll take them at the end, if that's questions at the end, I was going to say. Um, we have a few coming through on the on the Q and A, but uh, do remember it, Daniel, and we'll come back to it. Um, that's we still haven't got Denis, have we? we might yeah, I'm here. Like to I'm here, speaker, but, your uh, laptop. Okay, yeah. something might happen. <laughs> but you don't hear me. Hang on, let's just see. Yes, might do. Let's try. Mm -hmm. It should be able to hear it now. Denis, have we got you? Uh, yes, I'm here. Right. right. Okay, great. So we go, can we go back to quickly on contract formation? Yes, yes, quickly. Then, uh, what I was saying was that I, I, uh, I think that on this point, uh, the, the formation of contracts, most legal systems d d converge nowadays. So if you take the, the CISG and the, the UNIDRA principles, uh, you see that normally a contract is formed by an offer and its acceptance. And the acceptance should be unconditional. So uh, you must not alter the, the terms of the offer uh, unless the acceptance uh, proposes a, a minor change about uh, an additional term which does not alter uh, the main characteristics of the, of the offer. So it means, to, to answer the question of incorporation of a term, that in both systems, in fact, normally, a term is incorporated by being included in the offer, or if it is a minor term which does not uh, alter the, the offer, it can be incorporated by being included in the acceptance, but the offeror should not uh, object to it. The, the real difference between the CISG and the UNIDRA principles is that in the UNIDRA principles, there is an additional provision saying that a contract can also be formed 
um, by conduct of the parties showing agreement. And this is obviously much more flexible. And I think also uh, more conform to reality, more realistic, because uh, we know that a lot of business contracts are concluded by an offer followed by an acceptance. And very often after that, you have a third step, which is the drafting and signature of um, a, a, an official contractual document. But sometimes, and if I'm not mistaken, it is an issue that uh, English case law has dealt with. I think Lord Denning made uh, observations in a case, but he was uh, in the minority. Uh, a contract can be formed uh, in, in, a, in a way where you cannot see a real offer and a real acceptance, but you only see that at one point the parties agreed. So he, 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 the UNIRA principles acknowledge that, and uh, it means that, in fact, you can say that under the UNIRA principles, a term can be incorporated in a contract by any way showing that the parties agreed on it. So you can imagine, uh, and if you add to that, that uh, of course there is no formal requirement as to the, the validity of contracts, it means that you can incorporate a term into a contract under the UNIDRA principles uh, in a lot of ways uh, through uh, an exchange of emails or uh, uh, something, even a, a placard in a business, you could argue that uh, if in your place of business, there is a term on the wall, which is very, very uh, obvious. Uh, and if it say that anybody doing business with you accept uh, those terms, then it is incorporated. So it is more flexible, but it opens, uh, I think, also uh, a lot of uh, space for debate. Uh, so in a, in a very um, summarized way, I, I think I can say that, but of course, uh, if, if we have questions on this, we can come back to those issues. Do you want me to move on to Kebab G or Kebab J? I don't know. Yes, however you pronounce it, we'd, we'd love to hear from you on it. All right. Um, well, uh, about this, the, this case, um, there is something that I think uh, you, you, you did not really understand. Uh, I'm sorry, but on the other hand, <laughs> it, very possible. Oh. <laughs> but on the other hand, it is very subtle, and I think that uh, it, it, it is difficult to understand. What I mean is, uh, I totally follow you about the separability principle and uh, your idea, Peter, that uh, Article 1447 of the French Code of Civil Procedure may uh, describe this principle in a very strong way. It, it says that uh, an arbitration clause is totally independent from the contract uh, which contains it, and that if the contract is void, the arbitration agreement is still valid and it works the other way around. If the arbitration agreement is void, it is stricken out, but the contract is still valid. All right. Uh, and of course, this leads naturally to the idea that, uh, ah, I, I think there is a Larsen effect. Yeah. Okay. Right. Maybe. Everybody uh, who is not speaking should just shut off their, their mics. Yeah, so the separability principle leads uh, naturally to the idea that the law applicable to the contract as a whole is not necessarily the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. Uh, and on up to this point, I think that uh, English and French case law are not different, in fact. But it's here that uh, we can see a difference and that uh, French case law becomes exotic. Because French case law and in the Kebab G and in, or as in other case, cases, that's what the, the court said. Uh, according to French case law, an international arbitration clause is not submitted to, to the law of the seat. And in this case, it would be French law. No, um, this case law says that an international arbitration agreement is submitted to no national law at all. 
So it's not French law, it's not English law, it's no national law at all. So the idea is that an international arbitration agreement by its very nature must escape any domestic law. And it should be submitted to what uh, French courts call the substantive rule, a substantive rule of international arbitration law. So I, I know that uh, this idea is quite disputable and I will come to this, but just humor me for a few more minutes, <laughs> okay? Um, so this is the idea. And uh, this, pr this principle is not mandatory, meaning that, and French, uh, K, uh, French judgments have said so, the parties can totally decide to submit their arbitration agreement to a national law. It is totally allowed and French courts will respect such a choice. But what it means is just that if there is no, uh, do, do you hear me? No, yeah? Okay, so what it means is that if the parties in a contract just say that their contract is governed by, let's say, English law, it works for the whole contract, but not for the arbitration agreement. Now, if the parties say that their contract, including the arbitration agreement, is governed by English law, French courts will respect that and will uh, analyze the arbitration agreement by applying English law. But uh, as you as you know, uh, such pr such provisions are very rare, uh, maybe even theoretical. I've never seen such provisions. When you have a choice of law in the contract, it is general. It is for the whole contract, and you don't have an express provision saying that this national law should also apply to the arbitration agreement. So, in most contracts, there is no express and specific provision as to the law applicable to the arbitration agreement, and under this French approach the arbitration agreement is then governed by uh, a substantive rule of international uh, arbitration law. And it is not French law. So when you analyze the arbitration agreement, when French courts analyze the arbitration agreement, they don't apply the provisions of the civil code about contracts. They apply a set of principles that they have stated out. And uh, it is not judge-made law. It's not like common law because French courts do not pre uh, purport uh, to create those rules. They uh, think that they identify and uh, describe rules which pre-exist even if they are not written. I think that this substantive, this quite mysterious, substantive uh, rule of international arbitration law is a kind of customary, of international customary law. And to, to put it simply, I think we can say that in the idea of French courts, in fact, this substantive rule of international arbitration law is the procedural part of Lex Mercatoria. So they don't create it, they just look to uh, the void of international relations and the uh, see the rules. So what are those rules? They are very simple. An arbitration, the first principle is that an arbitration agreement is valid. And after that, an international arbitration agreement is valid. It may be void or it may not exist if the parties did not agree on it, but it's a question of fact. So courts must analyze the circumstances of the case to see whether the parties really agreed to the arbitration agreement. And uh, you have a few cases about the agreement of a corporation. Uh, it is very flexible, uh, even if a corporation was not properly represented by someone who signed the arbitration agreement, French courts will recognize its uh, enforceability as long as the other party could legitimately believe that the signatory had a proper power of attorney. Now, if we, if we, in the Kabab G case, the Court of Appeal uh, applied exactly those principles. The Court of Appeal uh, pointed out that the parties did not expressly and specifically choose English law as the law governed by, uh, as the law governing the arbitration clause. And if they had 
chosen uh, English law for the arbitration clause expressly, the Court of Appeal of Paris would have totally respected their choice. But they did not. So the Court of Appeal of Paris applied this substantive rule. And under this substantive rule, and there are numerous cases about that, when, you, uh, when a party actively performs a contract and takes part in the performance of a contract, which contains an arbitration clause, this party is considered to have accepted the arbitration clause. So that's exactly what the court said here. Here, um, KFG, uh, the franchisee, uh, the, the company which had absorbed the franchisee, uh, had uh, during five years taken part in the performance of the contract uh, and KBG also had go, uh, gone had uh, carried on its obligations after, even after the, the merger. Uh, so and, and the, both parties had uh, began negotiation uh, to try to renew the contract. So according to the Court of Appeal, it meant that both parties had uh, actively, uh, taken part in the performance of the contract, so they had accepted uh, the arbitration clause. Uh, and now, if you think about it, um, this, this approach uh, as to the, the consent to the arbitration agreement is also very flexible, and it is not very protective because uh, it consists in not looking to find uh, um, a very definitive uh, clue of consent on the part of, of the parties. But uh, to explain it, I, 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 again, uh, explaining doesn't mean that um, I necessarily totally agree, but there is two underlying ideas which explain why uh, French courts are so uh, liberal, so flexible uh, as to uh, acceptation of an arbitration agreement. The first idea is that arbitration is the normal way of settling international trade disputes. So uh, parties involved in international trade should not be surprised uh, by the existence of an arbitration agreement in a contract they have performed, even though they did not necessarily sign it. And uh, the other idea, uh, but it is linked, uh, is, uh, is that for the, the sake of efficiency, it should not be possible to discuss too much uh, the jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal. So um, if, if you are too demanding as to formality, uh, you may hamper the, the, all the process. Um, so th that is uh, French law, and uh, one may agree, disagree, discuss all this, of course, but there is one point I think, uh, there is one important point I think, it is very necessary to, to distinguish the principle of separability which French courts apply, because in fact it is not fundamentally different from uh, the principle of separability that uh, that uh, any all the legal systems recognize as to arbitration clauses, and the idea that an arbitration in an international arbitration agreement uh, is naturally governed by uh, true transnational principles, because this idea is very French, and uh, and you don't find it elsewhere. But the first the separability the separability principle is uh, very common. Uh, I hope I, I've been uh, clear because it's very, uh, very complex. I think this, this case law, of course, uh, we can come back to this uh, through after the questions, if necessary. Thank you. Oh, oh, now I don't hear you. I think you have muted your mics. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I can. That's great. Uh, we will move on to the putative law. So, um, Annalise, if the, the putative law, 
where there is dispute, you know, the, the analysis has to start somewhere. You either determine whether do you there is the law of the putative contract or the contract and then what its terms are, including what law it is. What, what do we say as a matter of English? <laughs> well, uh, Dicey, Dicey has the answer here and it's very clear that says that the putative law is the law that would govern were the contract to exist. So uh, in, in other words, you, you look at the existence and validity of a contract or any term of a contract are determined by the law which would govern it if the contract or term were valid. So that's, that's where you start. And uh, Peter, in his inimitable fashion, has set out all the cases referred to in Dicey. I think because we're a bit short of time, I'm not going to uh, go over them. But certainly in Kebab G, it was said, when a court has to decide whether an international arbitration agreement is valid or whether it covers a particular dispute, the first step is to identify which system of law the court must apply to answer this question. I also wanted to mention a Singaporean case. Um, this was a case in the Court of Appeal in Singapore, which interestingly had uh, not only Sundaresh Menon, uh, I hope you've all heard him speak. If you ever get the opportunity to hear him speak, he's a truly inspirational uh, speaker. Uh, but also Andrew Leong, but also Lord Matz was sitting there as an international judge in the Singapore Court of Appeal. And that's a case called Lu and Nag Nargol Walla. Um, I'm not going to help you with that. And the court there accepted the three stage approach endorsed in ENCA for deciding these questions. So, just to remind you what that is, you look at the law expressly or impliedly chosen by the parties, or, or secondly, if you don't have that choice, the law with which it's most uh, closely connected. And the reason I mention that is there are some older cases which have resorted to Lex uh, Forey, um, such as the Heide, Heide, Heidberg. Heidelberg. Or Heide, yeah, Heidberg. Um, so just be a bit careful about those. So I could go on for longer, but hopefully that explains where we are now under English law. And Denise, is it is it the same under French law? Yeah. Yes. Uh, That's I, easy. <laughs> you hear me? All right. Um, I I would say, but I, I maybe I did not really understand or not exactly the question. But I would say that uh, on this point, French courts would have a quite straightforward approach, uh, and I would distinguish uh, to, to the, the contract in general and the arbitration agreement. Uh, if we talk about the contract in general. Uh, when we have a, a, a situation in which we don't even know whether there is a contract, uh, we have to apply a national law to decide whether there was a contract. And to determine the uh, applicable law, there are two possibilities. First, it may happen that the parties did not, may not have concluded the main contract, but have definitely concluded an agreement about the, the applicable law. Just one of the terms had been uh, accepted by both parties. It was the choice of the applicable, applicable law. Then the French court would apply the law chosen by the parties. But if you cannot even find an agreement about the applicable law, a French court will just look for the applicable law. And if there is a, a, an issue as to the conflict of laws rule which should be applied, it's not really a difficulty because norm normally an, uh, in private international law in France, judges apply their categories. So if you, if you have to decide whether uh, a, a dispute pertains to contracts or to real estate or to the capacity of, legal, of physical persons, um, you don't need a, an applicable law to decide that because you just apply the law of the court, which is in, in our uh, hypothesis, French law. So I don't think there would really be a problem about the, the putative law. As to the international arbitration agreement, if we are talking about uh, uh, questions related to an arbit international arbitration agreement, does it exist? Was it formed? What is its scope? How should we interpret it? Um, well, again, French courts would have 
uh, the approach I, I described. So unless the parties have expressly and very specifically chosen the law applicable to the arbitration agreement, which never happens, French courts will say this arbitration agreement is governed by uh, 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 this uh, substantive rule of international arbitration law that we have identified and described. And under uh, this rule, an arbitration agreement exists and is valid as long as the facts of the case, the evidence, uh, shows that the parties have uh, accepted it and understood uh, what it was about. And again, uh, as long as a party has taken part actively in the performance of a contract containing an arbitration clause, this party uh, is considered as having accepted the arbitration agreement. So uh, I think the advantage of this approach is that you avoid uh, a lot of uh, questions about uh, this precise problem of the putative law. <laughs> well, that, that's Peter, a nice solution. Can I yeah, come in on of course this. you can. Yeah. What Denis has said about the French approach to the applicable law of an arbitration clause is very interesting. But we would want, would we not, or I speak for myself, I would want to understand how clear and precise the substantive rules of international arbitration law are before I wanted us here to subscribe to that um, attractive approach in so far as it's an international approach. I mean, if the rules are such or so flexible or so um, equivocal uh, that there could be a great argument about what those rules were, then one would, might, would hesitate to sign up to. But I think, speaking for myself, I would like to understand um, in the future, um, exactly how clear these uh, international rules are. And if they are clear, then there's a lot to be said, I suggest, for yeah. our changing our law so as to apply in the absence of an express agreement about the applicable law uh, to the arbitration clause. Well, I think that French arbitration specialists themselves sometime would, under, would, be, would like to be certain to understand the content of the substantive rule. Uh, it's a bit of a joke, but uh, of course, as each time uh, courts try to um, write down uh, or identify uh, principles which are supposed to be uh, part of a transnational custom, uh, the problem is uh, what are those rules? Uh, are they precise enough, etc., etc.? That, that, that is the, the main criticism against Lex Marcatoria, as you know. But uh, on the other hand, to be, uh, to be um, fair to, to the, the French case law, uh, if, you, if you look at, I think, roughly 20 cases which, about, which have applied this substantive rule, you can understand a few things. Uh, first, there is a strong favor towards the validity of arbitra international arbitration agreement. And in a, in a case, in a 2000 case, the Zanzi case, the Court of Cassation even uh, um, used those words, the principle of validity of international arbitration agreement. So the idea is that you begin by this principle, normally an international arbitration agreement is valid and efficient. And then there are some uh, situations in which it may not be. First, if the, the evidence shows that the parties did not accept the arbitration agreement or did not understand what it was about, or uh, if uh, a party, uh, when you have a problem of representation of a corporation and the other party could not legitimately believe that the signatory of the arbitration agreement uh, represented the other company. So for instance, if uh, the CEO of a company writes to the other party saying, be aware that Mrs. Uh, so-and-so is no longer our employee and cannot uh, commit my company. And if this person signs the arbitration agreement, the other party cannot legitimately believe that this corporation was 
uh, represented. And there is a, a last uh, exception. All those cases say that an arbitration agreement is not valid if it is contrary to international public policy. So for instance, if an arbitration agreement is about a, a dispute which is obviously not arbitrable in most countries, uh, then it would not be valid. But I agree with, with you, uh, Nicolas, uh, the problem, this approach is uh, very seductive on, on one hand, on the one hand, but of course it's problem, uh, it's, it's limit, uh, it's that we can have some uh, fear about uh, the, the, the content of the substantive rule. But on the other hand, uh, if you want to be sure to escape this uncertainty, as I said, the parties can always, in the arbitration uh, clause, expressly provide that the arbitration clause is submitted to, for instance, French law. It's not the same thing, because if you submit it to French law, then all the provisions of the civil code about contract supply and those provisions are uh, precise, of course. Thank you. That's a very interesting answer that gives us some comfort, but possibly not total comfort, did he? Um, right, we, we are a little behind time due to our technical problems. Um, so we are going to um, touch very, very quickly on a couple of issues. Um, very quickly. Um, if there is ultimately found to be uh, no arbitration agreement, then the arbitrators never had any jurisdiction to make any decision. So the final decision will always rest with the courts. But it depends on where you start. Uh, so you can start with, if there is an arbitration, how the courts might become involved. And Lisa, you can tell us in three sentences. <laughs> I'll give, you, I'll give you five. There we go. Yeah. So uh, in a nutshell, to simplify this down, it is quite confusing, I think, when you look at the rules. It, the Arbitration Act doesn't make it easy for you, and I think it's something the Law Commission could look at in their review of the yeah. Arbitration Act. But in a nutshell, if you don't participate in an arbitration, you retain all your rights to apply to the court for determination of a jurisdictional issue. But obviously, you can't seek to have that jurisdictional issue determined by the tribunal. By contrast, if you participate in an arbitration for the purposes of the issue of jurisdiction, you have the right to refer that issue to the tribunal, but you have much more limited rights of recourse for the court. Because section 32 says you can only then refer it to the court if all parties agree or the tribunal gives permission. You still have section 67 when you're um, seeking to set aside an award or resist enforcement. That's obviously at the end of the process. How's that, Peter? Very good, very good. <laughs> and, and, and Nicholas, conversely, if you had court proceedings commenced, you would, are you well, section nine? Well, you've got section nine um, applying for um, a, a stay if you say there should be an arbitration agreement and then court proceedings um, Annalise has touched on section 32 which is a preliminary point on jurisdiction I don't think she mentioned section 45 which is a preliminary point on law she mentioned 67 which is post award a challenge to jurisdiction she didn't mention 68 because she didn't have time. <laughs> That's um, uh, a post-award complaint about serious irregularity. Um, and she didn't mention 69. That's an appeal on law. But she did mention section 72, uh, which is the non-participant having a wider go in court. But, but a, of course, he hasn't had any go at all before the tribunal. Yeah, and I, you do need to make sure that you've taken the right steps before the tribunal that you haven't waived any of these remedies. I did have it play out in practice once. It's incredibly complicated to work out what's the best route for the client. It's not, it's not straightforward. It, it's not. I, I too have had to grapple with that. Um, we were going to talk about um, the law applicable to an issue as opposed to the proper law of a contract which has a whole different set of uh, criteria. Uh, and there's a very recent decision from the Court of Appeal called Lifestyle Equities, uh, where the court was split, um, uh, Snowden and Lewis and Hart, and Lady Justice McCure, Lady Justice McCure, um, with the greatest respect, another family judge, I think, Nicholas, uh, yes. 
gr grappling, um, I think, um, uh, with with which side to to go with. Um, I detect. Anyhow, I don't think we've got time for that. We'll take some questions now. Uh, uh, I'll have a look at the Q and A's on the from the virtual audience. But I'll, while I do that, I'll take one from the live audience. Daniel, did you want to ask? Uh, yes, probably. I'll ask it. Um, <laughs> might have been answered. Um, but from the tribunal, um, dealing with uh, arg arguments around um, any of these matters, but let's start with, uh, let's focus on the first one, which is the uh, issue about the law. Um, it's being of such significance to the outcome in terms of the certainty uh, that the parties will have this as far as enforceability. Is it um, is the argument, let's say, uh, made a red, red flag as far as the tribunal's focus of the proceedings is concerned, such that there should be um, you know, an exercise of great caution in proceeding um, simply with you know, boldly go, so to speak, you know, proceeding with the arbitration? Or is it Best that, they, that the tribunal uh, steps back a bit, allows the parties to perhaps take this to the level. Let, let's be realistic. Um, arbitrators get paid <laughs> um, only if they do their job. Uh, and I think most arbitrators would be happy to rule on their own jurisdiction. Uh, I think that'd be my experience. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's what you're there to take the difficult decisions as well as the, the easy decisions. So I think arbitrators should be taking that, but obviously with the right to go to court. So Emily, section 32, the consent of the parties, let's assume there's no consent, the permission of the court. How often does the court, how, or the permission of the tribunal, how often does the tribunal give permission to go to court on a preliminary issue like this? Well, I've never seen it. I don't know if you have Peter. No, I haven't. Um, no. Uh, uh, no, I think there was a case recently, um, this is Justice O'Farrell, I, 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 I've got her in mind, uh, and uh, she refused to rule on a section 32 mm. on the basis that there was a non-participating party and it would effectively remove their rights under 72 uh, to challenge. And she said, no, you can't get it through the, well, you can't get through the front door, you can't get through the back door, essentially. But I may have got that wrong. Um, but someone's nodding in the audience here. Also, she's the most appealed TCC judge in existence. Ben will have an interest in it too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, in the context of construction law, adjudication is routinely the jurisdiction is determined by the arbitrator, by the adjudicator, but then it goes to court. And I think coming back to your question, you might be saying there should be a process for determining that more quickly, rather than it having to have permission, maybe. You should write to the Law Commission and get them to look at it. Uh, th there's, a, there's a comment, at least online, for those who are doing the moot about the AIAC. I think it's better off. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. Is it? Yeah, it's, we're getting there. Um, Right now. Really? Is that? <laughs> so I, I will answer. Uh, that? How's that? Is that good? They say hybrid hearings are more difficult. <laughs> I think this is demonstrating you're fully remote or in person. Are we there? Well, no one's. You are muted, it says. Oh, you are. You're on. You're on. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm on the big systems, that's all right. Um, there's a, um, a comment or slash question for those who are doing the moot um, about the, the particular rules that we're under this year, the AIAC rules and a large um, degree of separability here there and the power of the tribunal to determine the proper law. Um, so watch for that if you're doing that. Um, Uh, another comment, parties do not usually consider the fact that the arbitration clause may be governed by another law other than the law of the contract. The need for wider sharing of information should help. Uh, well, hopefully we've done our bit there today um, about that. Um, are there any more questions live? Yes, David, how are you? others to hear me. That's if they wish to do so. Um, uh, uh, a number of years ago, I was in an arbitration as an arbitrator, and I tried to persuade my co-arbitrators, unsuccessfully as it turned out, that we should have a two-tier approach. Uh, the scenario was that this was an arbitration very clearly uh, designated uh, to have Korean law uh, as the law of the uh, arbitration, the law of everything we were to apply in it. Uh, the contract, uh, 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 the place of the events in the arbitration was Oman, uh, but the contract was written entirely within the scope of English contract law. Uh, and what I sought to say to my co-arbitrators, the right approach was to construe the wording of the uh, contract written, and we had evidence that it was written by English law, lawyers in an English law firm. Uh, and what we should do was uh, to uh, construe the wording uh, of the uh, contract under English law so we knew what the issues were. And then once we knew what the issues were, then move on to Korean law. So it's a two-tier approach. First of all, contract, English law, uh, what did it mean under English law? And then secondly, the overall position was Korean law. <laughs> uh, the, the, this happened, this arose in the course of our deliberations and the parties went around to put their bit in. Mike. Thank you very much again. I don't know whether it's going to help or hinder. Um, I was just going to go back to um, Kababji, and I was wondering whether the uh, court had been led up the garden path, or perhaps had been predisposed to lead itself up the garden path, by the way in which the arbitrators had expressed the um, change of party from Kuz or Kaut um, and the AHFG, which was sitting behind that as the, um, uh, the, the parent company, uh, all the other way around. Um, because it had been said by the um, arbitrators that there had been a novation by addition. And there's a lot of explanation about novation and what is the what the requirements of novation. But going back to what Denis was saying about um, uh, Kebabji, particularly as presented in the French courts, it seemed that really what had happened was that it had simply been a further agreement uh, between uh, the replacement party on the original terms in the course of four or five years course of conduct between the new company instead of the old company. So to what extent does this come down to a debate between uh, novation by addition, which is frankly a rather startling proposition to an English lawyer, and um, uh, agreement by conduct, which is much less startling and appears to be the way in which it was argued in the French courts. So just in case anyone uh, virtually didn't hear the question, uh, I'll, I'll try and summarize it. It's, it's whether uh, in Kibabji, the, the way it was presented is determinative. Uh, the English court certainly focused on the concept of novation by addition, which was completely um, alien to an English mindset, whereas the French courts may have focused on a course of conduct um, which 
which they ultimately accepted was um, successful in terms of replacing a party. Presumably it had the money. Uh, the, 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 the original contract, I mean, you usually sue people with money. It's always a good starting point. And if, if the original contracting party had sort of phased out of existence or out of commercial existence, I suspect that was the point, but I don't know if anyone knows, but that's my guess. Uh, oh, don't ask any for a comment because <laughs> we will then have all the sorts of noise problems we had before. So unfortunately, you're not going to get an answer from Denis on, on that one. Um, but 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 I think um, my, it is going to message an answer and we'll, I'll read it out when it comes through. But um, I, I also think very significant in Kebabji was the, the NOM, the no oral modification. Yeah, uh, I mean, I do, picking up on something Denis said, I do also think um, that the French courts are inherently more pro-arbitration, dare I say it, than the English courts. I don't think we have the same mindset that commercial disputes should be resolved by arbitration as opposed to by commercial court, for example. So I wonder if that also plays in subconsciously. Uh, we also, ha in this country, have this sometimes this strange division between people who go to court and people who go to arbitration, which I hope we will get rid of going forward a bit more so people can do both. Um, because I think they feed into each other, certainly when it comes to resolving commercial disputes in a way that suits clients, which is ultimately what it should be there for. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, and what uh, I, Jenny said, I agree. The Court of Appeal of Paris <laughs> is really reasoned on the basis of an agreement to, uh, on the basis of an agreement by conduct, at least on the arbitration agreement. This notion of novation by addition, which I don't really understand, is not in the judgment, although it's been latched onto somewhere. Uh, but it's an inter interesting case and perhaps one on its facts, although it does appear to be of general application, except the way the judgment is set up. Uh, I don't want to keep certainly the live audience any longer from agreeing. So, can, can I, uh, I, I comment on the two tier approach uh, that, that I was advocating to my co-arbitrators in this arbitration a long ago. It was wrong. If the first of your tiers involved a decision about law without identifying the applicable law, then it would be hard for me to subscribe to it. Whenever one looks at something, one wants a lens What's the lens? And the lens, um, surely, is the applicable law. And so, insofar as your first stage was, forget about applicable law, let's just look at it and interpret it in accordance with English law. Unless English law was the applicable law, then I would find it quite hard to subscribe to. It's, it was a very pragmatic suggestion. I think we need. I think we need a drink now. Is the person in the middle? So yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd just like to record and thank uh, my my panelists uh, this evening. Uh, it's now this evening, it was this afternoon when we started. Uh, in particular, my thanks to. Um, yeah, yes, it was in the award. The as Denis said, the novation by addition point. Um, I'd like to thank Denis particularly for persevering through the technological problems. My great thanks to you, and I look forward to visiting. Uh, you in, in Aix rather than Paris. It's much nicer down there, certainly in the springtime. I will endeavour to make, make a trip. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nicholas Wilson uh, and Annelise Day for their contributions today. If certainly those in physical attendance would like to express their thanks in the traditional time-ordered way. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies to the virtual audience that they won't get a drink, um, but... Um, Certainly those in, in here are going to enjoy one. So thank you all. Uh, if anybody is um, at a loose end on, on Saturday and would like to judge in our pre-moot, uh, we do have a few slots available. Um, we've had a little bit of juggling going on with both teams and arbitrators. Um, we, have, we have some available slots if anyone would like to come along. Uh, we just have a word with me um, or Karen. Are you here, Karen? Yes, you are. Uh, Karen, who's waving her arm right at the back. Uh, 
uh, about your willingness to do so. We have slots both for uh, chairs and for co-arbitrators on the Saturday. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you all again next year. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.